there's a big difference between the feel of something and when you're describing what something feels like mm -hmm. versus being able to um, say that this is actually what's happening. Yeah. Uh, but but it seemed to me, I mean, when you look at the video, I, can you see that in the background? Yeah. Okay. I mean, he's literally talking about going straight down, yet he never did that. No. Like, I mean, when you look at when you look at his history, he just doesn't do that. He gets off his backside like crazy. Let me show you. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of the bottom half of the screen. There you go. Can I make it bigger? This is him. So explaining this, I'm and in the blog post, I'm gonna have the video itself will be there. Okay. So I'm gonna urge people to watch it. But this is basically the video of him in his backyard. This is the right. video of him swinging in his backyard. Right. And so this is him describing how he's going down. And if you look at his back foot, he's, you know, squishing bugs, yeah. which he also didn't do. Yeah. And then he starts talking about his knee going straight down in the ground, <laughs> which, which, do, which did happen in his swing, yeah. but it happened way later after he released off his backside. Mm-hmm. But the down thing to me, um, especially when he started talking about how the only way to lift it yeah. is to go down. <laughs> um, I mean, all of the video, all of the stuff I've ever done, whatever line that bat is going down. So if you're actually going to swing down, mm -hmm. then right now, if I draw a line off of that, going in the same direction the bat's coming from, yeah, he can only let me let me get rid of some of this whatever line that thing is following, which this is crazy, this is way over exaggerated. I'm sure it's part of that's just for just for show to be sure what he's talking about. But any any ball well let me draw this the other way. And let's just assume that my line is right, which I know it's not, but let's just assume that that's the line that his bat was going on. The only the only top exit velocity he's gonna get it's 10 degrees on one side or the other. In other words, if you swing down, the only way you're going to hit maximum exit velocity is if you hit it within 10 degrees one way or another of the line that that bat's swinging on. Right. Because the second you get away from that, you start getting these crazy deflections, which is, which is what we've been talking about a lot. Yeah. Like if the pitch is coming down and you hit it at 45 degrees, that's a huge deflection away from that. That's why the homers are usually at 100 or 108 or 105 because you've missed, you've mishit the ball to a large degree, and the deflection makes it go up like that. It's it's just a round ball, round bat thing. Right. But the yeah. craziest part for me is to watch what he does, and and then realize he doesn't do any of that. <laughs> When he swings, I mean, you see his foot go down there, but watch him from the side. You'll see him release. I mean, this thing is in our way, but you see him release off the backside. You see the barrel not going so much down, although everybody goes down to some degree. So right up until that moment, you could say his swing's going down, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't think I'm not sure if that's what he's talking about, yeah. or whether he's going to take it a whole nother step. Because from here, from that point where it stops going down, as it enters into the hitting zone where he's going to make contact, that thing's going up. It's going upward, right? A little bit. But the back foot, that whole knee thing, doesn't happen until way after the ball's gone. Hmm. There's quite a few of these that I've looked at, and. They're all like that. This one, he swings and misses. I've used this one in a YouTube video, but you see how the barrel goes down mm. and then goes up mm -hmm. very clearly. Yeah. Backside releases. And the knee doesn't come down until after all that other stuff happens. And then to me, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's already, the ball's already gone. Right. So I don't, I, I really honestly, I'm not sure what he means fully. By that 
by by the comments. Yeah. I, I, I do agree with the idea that launch angle has just gone way over the deep end and way, way, way too far. Yeah, so I, I picked up kind of three major things that he was bringing up, three major maybe hot button topics that you hear on hitting Twitter. And, and the one you were just covering was real versus feel, right? What's, what's real, right. what their feel is, doesn't really match their real. And I agree with you. I teach my hitters based on, on feel too, to get certain reels, right? So if a hitter's, right. we talked about this before in videos, if a hitter's uppercutting too much, we tell them to swing down so that they end up in the middle. And, and I tell my hitters, it's like your body's a step behind your brain. And your brain has to kind of go above and beyond, has to make it extreme, make the cue extreme in order to get the body that one step behind in the, you know, in the middle. So real versus right. was one, the first thing, one thing that he talked about how to be effective as a hitter. You know, he talked about how to lift the ball. So that was kind of the second thing he was, at least from my, my perspective, he was mixing and matching different things. And we can talk about right. that. Um, and the third thing was sabermetrics versus experience. You can definitely tell that he is a anti kind of anti saber <laughs> guy. <laughs> he was talking about yeah, you he, think? he cares about strikeouts anymore and and everybody's about power and hitting homers and he said, you know, contact is king and again it's it's not a it's like people go to either one side or the other. There's no it's like there's no moderation and there was a comment that kind of was like, you know what, maybe this is worth talking to Perry about. And somebody had after this video came out a couple weeks ago, somebody goes, hey, Joey, what do you think about this? And I said, well, it's funny because Alex Rodriguez is right and wrong at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> you know, analytics, I, I've been, um, I've talked a lot about analytics because, and, and some good and some bad, because I believe that some of it's really good and some of it's really bad. Yeah. Right, right now, pitch sequencing stuff, is really bad and all you have to do is look at the homer explosion once again mm -hmm. to see that it's really bad because it's really hard to get 100 100 contact enough to hit that many homers and so for, for my money that's a direct result of poor pitch selection but yeah. at, at any rate the, the the analytics that i would would bring up in, in this a rod conversation would be let's get you on or get anybody on a measuring device and let's measure the exit speed let's measure the launch angle based on what you just said because anyone who is going to be that adamant about their mechanics whether it's teacher man or whether it's uh you know whoever whoever the the, the guy is um that is you know out there Getting teaching closer. yeah yeah, whoever it might be, if you're that adamant about something, and this is what, what the, the whole thing about what I, the way I started was 100% that. It was getting in arguments going, no, I don't think you're right. Let's go out there and test it and let's prove it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's about being able to quantify what it is you're talking about. And you can't quantify the bat going down, 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 down. It does go down, but it goes down to a point and it depends on how quick it goes down. I think that's what some of the newer guys are talking about. Is they want it to go down earlier mm -hmm. in order to get it going up sooner. Yeah. And that actually works as long as pitches are down, as long as they're all going down at severe angles. But to say that your bat is going down right to the ball is, is one of the things that he said pretty clearly <laughs> and showed an example of him going down to the ball. If you if you do the math on that, if you actually test that, you can hit the ball really hard like that. But it's but everyone you hit hard is going to go down. They're not. It's not going to lift at all. And so that would be the number one thing I would say is that on the analytic side, test it. Show me because none of the stuff that I hear and none of the stuff that I see on the internet, very little of it is actually testable. Um, I, I want to get into this with you today um, because this is I've, I've I've had a kind of an aha moment about why guys hate the T exit speed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if now is the best time to, to talk about it, but I, I go ahead if you can remember bring that back up because I really want to talk about that. Yeah, let's talk um, about it. 
Um, but like with this, with this, with this example, with a -Rod talking about making the bat go down, 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 down. If you if you test that and you put a target out there at whatever angle you want, if you want the ball to be at 40 degree launch angle, okay, well let's put the target at 40 degrees, mm -hmm. and let's have you swing down at that in order to create that. Number one, if you did hit it up there, it was it's going to deflect so badly off of the ball that it's going to, when the ball takes off, it's going to have, it's going to be a pop-up, literally, with with maybe 25 or 30%, 40% uh, of your maximum exit velocity. Right. Because it, it, you just can't get maximum, anywhere near maximum, when you're swinging that far away from the line that you want the ball to go on. So that that's the physics part of it. That, that's You can't argue that. You know, you can, you can, well, you can't argue it because we do it every day. Everybody on the internet does it every day. Stupid. But it doesn't test out. When you test it, none of that matters. It doesn't work like that. Um, so, from with that said, we got into discussion. You and I and a couple of guys on the internet, and it was interesting. I I, I like those as long as they stay civil, right? Um, and people don't get too crazy with it. But one of the things that that was talked about was the fact that. Um, a lot of guys don't like T exit speed and they don't like the heavy ball. And it, it, it kind of it was weird for me at first to think about that. It's like, well, why wouldn't you want to know what the absolute baseline is? Because the guy hitting off the tee has no help from the pitch whatsoever. Right. So that number is super important because it's all about what, what I'm able to produce with no help from, from the pitch. You're isolating. And what's that? You're isolating the variable. Right. You're taking it down to the smallest yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. But then then I started thinking about it, and whenever I see someone for the first time, I want to get a T exit speed. I want heavy ball. I want a, a, a few different numbers that, that um, you and I will talk about off camera. Mm -hmm. But I want that those baseline numbers because they tell me the, the baseline, but they also tell me what it is that I can expect when we go to live BP, when we go to game exit speeds. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if, if you only do um, a pitching machine throwing in and you're swinging the bat and you, let's just say you have a, a hundred miles an hour of exit velocity, um, that's great. hundred miles an hour is great. You're, there's, it's hard to argue that, that that's not a good number. But is that your max number is, the, is where I always go with it is, is that your max? And the answer is, I don't know, you don't know, and your hitter doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Because without the baseline, you have nothing to measure it off of. Like Carlos, um, back in the day, was at 99 off the tee, about 110 off live BP, and about 120 off in games. Mm -hmm. And that was the top out. His average, you know, I think one year he led, um, at, I think he led all of Major League Baseball in exit velocity one year. He was all fired up. He called me from uh, after talking to the GM of a club mm -hmm. and then saying, you know, we want you because you just, you led Major League Baseball in exit velocity. Yes. And that, that pumped both of us up because that was the whole goal. Yeah. But, but without knowing, if you don't know that you hit 99 off the tee, and then you go in and you, you look at your game exit speeds, and they're at 103. I can promise you that's nowhere near what your real max is. And so without that, without that baseline of, of no help from pitches, you just don't know. You're, yeah. you're standing in a round room hoping that you've got your best swing. But right. in reality, you haven't tested it to the point yet where you can, where you can say that with any certainty. Right, and and I and that's a perfect segue kind of into the how to be effective hitter. What what Alex Rodriguez was talking about. So he mentioned you know a few things and kind of intertwined some other ideas into that. But some of the notes that I jotted down <clears throat> were in that in that area of how to be effective hitter. So he talked about launch angles. He talked about line to line versus launch angles, and um, he talked about uh, that that doesn't really reveal much about power. What but do you think he meant by line to line? So line to line, I call it horizontals. I call, say, so yeah, I, I use the, the kind of three-dimensional pitching analogy and, you, and same and apply it to hitting, the three-dimensional hitting. So you, so you have 
verticals, which are your launch angles, basically. I call right. them verticals because I don't want my hitters talking launch angles with their coaches in high school because their coaches will blow a gasket. So we call it verticals. We call it something else. Um, so it's just okay. down, you know. And then we call it horizontals would be across the field. So if you get a hitter on a tee, like you're saying, you test them, right? We, we put them on a tee at the beginning of our sessions, and the tee's middle, middle, right down the middle. So they should be hitting the ball right up the middle. So I can see right away if they're pulling the ball more into the corner or they're going the other way too much, uh, then I know something's going wrong on usually their lower right. half. It has The lower half tends to be, but upper half stuff too. Um, so line to line, that's what I got that as. So he was – he was saying, no one launch angles shouldn't be worrying about, they should be learning, worrying about line to line. Well, we worry about both of those. We worry about the verticals, the horizontals, and then the velocity or the timing aspects, the third dimension. So you have up to down launch angles, uh, horizontals is your side to side is what A-Rod talks about. So two totally different things. Verticals and line to line are two totally different things, but they're very, I think both of them are very important. Um, and there's some cross pollination between those. And then there's the timing aspect, which we've talked, you and I have talked quite a bit about. Um, but when he talks about power, right? So you're, you're talking about when we are, so A-Rod mentioned the legs and getting his knee down and swinging down to get the ball to go up and these things. And so I, when, when you bring up the idea of testing certain, certain things, and you mentioned some, some of these guys out there when we were first kind of doing our, our series, our video series like this, our hitting, hitting series, that they had a hard time with T stuff. And, and you just talked about it this time too. So they had a hard time with proving stuff off the T. Well, number one, we have to isolate a variable. Number two, we have to see what hitting mechanics contribute to either bat speed, ball exit speed, launch angles, like verticals, horizontals, and timing. We have to see from a, a stripped down baseline what showing numbers means versus not. And and you and people can say all day long, they can say, well, Hitters, you know, the elite swing, they don't show their numbers. And it's like, well, wait a minute, man. I can take the science of it. I can show you the springy fascia and the spinal engine and how it all kind of, the, the kind of getting in the weeds of it. But then I can go and I can show you hitter after hitter in the top 20, top 30, top 40 hitters in the big leagues. And I can show you the ones that have power that are showing their numbers. So when they say, well, it has to be time tested. I think some guys were talking about when we were talking about the barred out front arm. Well, it has to be time tested. And that hasn't been time tested. Sure, it works in a, a laboratory or uh, an experiment, you know, when you're in a cage, you know, all, all factors are controlled. But wait a minute, we, there's so many examples in the past of hitters doing that. One being Ted Williams. I mean, one of the best hitters arguably ever that ever, ever played the game locked his lead arm out. So uh, time tested, yeah, it has been tested in the trenches. And that's the thing. So you, you have to, so my point is, is that when you're testing something, it helps if you got it on the tee, it could be like you said, with yours, I really like is you got the tee baseball, you got the tee heavy ball, and then you got kind of a live regular ball. So it gives you a snapshot of what happens when we change and put a heavy ball in there. What happens to the power output or like the, the sprinkler pressure, right? If a sprinkler blows, then all the other pressure on the other sprinklers, it all goes down because most of the pressure is being leaked out of blown sprinkler. So that that's the heavy ball. That's hitting the heavy ball off the tee. That's what that's going to tell you. Um, plus adding the idea of having the target there at 10 degrees so you can see where if the hitter has control over his mechanics and control over his hitting outcomes, you can see that. And, and you can take one mechanic like releasing the backside versus squishing the bug, and you can have the hitter take 10 swings one way, 10 swings another way, just doing a short, real quick example. Um, 100, 100 would probably be better, but you know, 10 and 10 would be, I think, very revealing and then have them see if they can control where – they're hitting the target or if they're hitting the target so you have to we, we have to see what certain hitting mechanics contribute to either verticals improving verticals or not improving them or improving or not improving horizontals and I think those tests really help and who cares if it's time test or not we need to know what they're contributing to the swing like you said with potential oh yeah I hit 100 in a game ball exit speed but is that your max are you maxing out and most people are right. They're doing this. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's my max. Well, I, if you don't know, then, hey, we've done, we've run tests on certain hitting mechanics and tell you that we can max you out on certain, at least, like we said, uh, pieces of the puzzle, right? Whether it's showing numbers, barring the front arm. We could tell you what each of those things contribute to the swing, and let's start mixing them in and see what happens. Right. 
I, you know, I, I've done a bunch of tests recently, um, like first time students that have come in and we had like, I'm going to say out of seven or eight new kids recently, there were an average of about seven or eight miles an hour mm. that was just mechanics. Because if you can take a player day one and look at the, look at the, the output, the swing output, and then change a couple of mechanics and then repeat it or, you know, repeat the test, and all of the numbers go up, especially the exit velocity, yeah. it, it, of an average of about eight miles an hour right now, not not at six weeks or a month from now after you get stronger, yeah. right now. Because if, if there's mechanical flaws, they show up right now. They don't show up over time. That's strength and, you know, coordinating the muscles and coordinating the movement patterns. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, that's a different thing completely. Right. So that will happen also. But first, you have to start to get those big, the big broad strokes of the swing, you know, separating and stretching and all of those things working. But it shows instantly when you touch on the right thing that they're not doing, it shows up right now. Yeah. It, it's, I've had a, tons of people that have bought the um, online course and send me videos of their players going up 10 or 12 or, you know, what, however many miles per hour. Um, there was a college coach that went from like 30 to almost 60 homers, I think, that their team hit. Mm -hmm. And he attributed 100% to, to just completely flip-flopping. He was a guy that would argue with me about the lead arm thing mm. and then just went to it. Mm -hmm. And I think his, his daughter was player of the year. Yeah. Um, so it, it was one of those things where if you, if you test it and you actually put it into play, the reason that you don't have any, um, any, anybody doing it anymore is because the whole world is teaching this, um, this other methodology. It's kind of like what A-Rod's going off about. Yeah. The fact that everybody's teaching launch angle. And it, it, it's such a weird thing to talk about because launch angle has so little to do with what people keep talking about as though the, it, as though just swinging like this equals launch angle. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, they've made it a character and it's, and it's a metric. It's not a character. It's a number. It doesn't have a brain. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just a simple, it's just a simple thing. It's like, it's like speed off the bat. It's a, it's a very simple um, thing that has so little to do with, um, uh, I shouldn't say that. It is an analytic, and it's absolutely the fact, and that's what, that's where analytics guys start from. Is well, this is the fact. The mm -hmm. fact is that um, Giancarlo Stanton hits the ball harder on 83 mile an hour sliders than he <laughs> does on 100 mile an hour fastballs or yeah. fastballs, especially in. Yeah. And the answer to that is you, you're right, but that doesn't mean that he's he he wouldn't hit the 100 mile an hour fastball in. If he kept the same mechanics, right, and he was on time, right, Contact. he would hit the, the hundred mile an hour ball much, much harder. Yeah. So I don't think he's ever hit a ball at his max. I don't think Aaron Judge has ever hit a ball at his max. Right. At least in 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 game situations, because until you smoke a hundred mile an hour fastball with your A mechanics, then you you don't know how hard you can hit it. Right. That's the part that I have the trouble with. Now the other the other point that A Rod was saying again uh, that I said that he's he's right and wrong at the same time you know he's talking about the Ferris wheel swing and all this kind of stuff and he's saying you can't get a Ferris wheel you can't use a Ferris wheel swing to get a fastball a 95 100 mile an hour fastball up and I think what did he call it the uh, what did he call it I, I loved his some of his language oh the blind spot he called it the blind spot yeah. uh, you know blind ball. Ball, right and we talked about that. Yeah. In, in one of our other videos where when you start to, when pitchers start to get EV efficient and that Ferris wheel type swing. And I know, I think I've seen, I, I think I've seen Mr. TM's, he, he was, I think, what was he saying to a rod? He was telling him, Hey, you know, well, let's, let's do a talk together and we'll talk about this and we'll have it live for everybody. And, 
uh, challenge, he challenged a rod and he said, we'll, we'll charge people by the minute, you know, and make sure it's worth it for you and all this stuff. And I'll teach you why the Ferris wheel. Well, and, and maybe I don't know exactly what the Ferris wheel is in, in his sense. Maybe you don't, maybe, you know, there's, there's people out there that do, but when I think of a Ferris wheel, maybe, maybe he's using the worst. Who, who teaches that? Who teaches the Ferris wheel concept? That's uh, teacher man, team, Mr. TM. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we, we might have it all wrong and the only ones that know it are the ones that actually listen to him um, or he could be using the <laughs> worst metaphor ever for a swing because a ferris wheel is vertical and it goes this way right so if people right. are, and, and it seemed like in some of his comments that i was i was watching he seems like he was getting really buttered and he's like he doesn't know what a, you know a rod he doesn't know what a ferris wheel swing is it's like well what is it then because a ferris wheel when you say ferris wheel it's like this that's what i'm saying it's probably one of the worst the worst metaphor is used if that's not what it is, uh, and it might not be. I'm, I stand corrected if it's not. But we talked about this where when you have a Ferris wheel type of swing, assuming that's what it means, is more of this kind of up and down swing, and you have that blind spot that A-Rod was talking about. Well, we got to have more of kind of a merry-go-round, right? So when people ask, I think somebody asked me the other day, just yesterday, so what do you, what do you think about this Ferris wheel swing or this fer Ferris wheel thing? And I said, well, here, here's the deal. He said, when, when, I said, when you're talking about different pitch locations, it could be vertical, it could be horizontal, it could be across, it could be up, and even, even timing-wise, right? You're going to have a little bit of both. The, this, just like the swing isn't all linear and it's not all rotational, uh, you know, we aren't born, 100% uh, uh, born athletes uh, or 100% work ethic athletes, you know, uh, what's, what's the other – it's either either this or that. It's either a Ferris wheel or a horse or a merry-go-round, you know. And I told him, I said, it's a little bit of both. There's there's in moderation, and it all depends. Like you might have more Ferris wheel down in the zone and away, and less merry-go-round up in the zone. You're gonna have more merry-go-round and in uh, more merry-go-round than Ferris wheel, and then you're just gonna you're gonna it's gonna kind of shape like the liquid analytics, right? <laughs> the swing itself right. is gonna kind of li be liquid, and it's gonna change depending on how you know pitch height versus depth versus timing right. to change. Well, there's 150 locations within six inches of the strike zone. <laughs> if you lined up baseballs within the area of the strike zone. I mean, probably not with what Major League Baseball calls the strike zone. It's a little, it's a little bit smaller than what I think the traditional nine boxes are if they're six inches by eight inches. There's, there's about 150 possibilities of where the ball could show up. And so you're going to take the same swing to each of those? Um, no, you can't. It's not. It's not physically possible. Yeah. So unless your unless your Ferris wheel or unless your Ferris wheel can tilt this way, mm -hmm. all the way to dead flat at the top of the strike zone, very go round, and then tilt a little bit on pitches that are lower. Because when you when you um, are playing fast pitch softball, I work with um, some of the top teams in the country. In fact, the top the top team in the country, um, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. you have to hit pitches that are here or you're going to lose. It's as mm -hmm. simple as that. Yeah. And that's going to happen in baseball soon also. But right now it's already happening in, in fast, in fast pitch softball at the collegiate level. And the best teams, uh, the best hitting teams, you see them break records and homers during the regular season. And when they get to playoffs, they're not very good because they, they have geared their swing like one, mm -hmm. one tilt. And that one tilt is the one that they use all the time. Yeah. And, and it, it only matches, I mean, it, any swing can hit any pitch as long as the timing is perfect. Yeah. But it, that's such a rare thing. It's, it's ridiculous. But the other point I wanted to make is let's just say that this thing could tilt this, whatever you want to call it, the carousel or the, or yeah. the, Ferris wheel. Um, the Ferris wheel. If, if you could tilt it and then you put it on wheels where it's moving and then it goes like that, mm -hmm. because that's what a swing is. The swing doesn't just rotate. Mm -hmm. it, it, it stretches from all kinds of places. Mm -hmm. And there's a gigantic forward movement that without that momentum, and that's one of the reasons why I criticize the, the idea of the old um, rotational mechanics. Mm -hmm. Most of the rotational guys that I've talked that I've talked to when they first started, it was stay on your backside and completely in nothing but rotation. Mm -hmm. And that is like 
dead, dead, dead wrong. None of that tests. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, in my swing personally, uh, back in the day, I, it was 11 miles an hour. There was an 11 mile an hour exit velocity difference by staying, having all the weight back and turning and crushing it and hitting my best bolt. That there was an 11 mile an hour differential between when you released, mm -hmm. and that was that was uh, in the 90s, early 90s, when I would still swing a lot just to kind of prove the point. Yeah. So my exit velocity was about 96 at that point, and for you know a middle infielder, that's pretty pretty solid. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was in the it was in the mid 80s when you spin. It was in the low 80s at times. So for me personally, that was an easy thing. Just test it and let's find out. Okay, I'm never going there again, <laughs> unless there's some other advantage to that. If there's another advantage to me staying back, and that's where they would argue too, is that if by staying back, I'm going to allow myself to buy more time and hit the ball back here. And while that is true, you're doing it at a lesser efficiency, but you're also losing that reach out, out front. So whatever you gain in here, you lose out there. So the depth of it is is a loss. Right. So it, you're losing no matter what you do. There's no way to do one thing and have it work. But the idea of a Ferris wheel or or the other, the carousel, is is right to some degree, but it has to be moving. Mm -hmm. It has to have momentum along with the rotation. Those two things mixed together is what that was is what the answer is. And 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 all you have to do is test it. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're a staunch, I only spin and I'm I don't need to test it. I've already done everything I need to do, and and this is perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, you know what what do, what do you say to that? I don't know what to say to that. But if you're afraid to test it, there's got to be a reason why you're afraid to test it. Yeah. And as soon as you test it, you're going to find out that if if you really want the max. You have to you have to take all of the cylinders of the motor and make them all work right. Because if if eight out of ten or however many cylinders there are, if eight out of ten are working really well at ninety percent, and the other two are at twenty percent, you still might have a, a machine that works pretty decent. But I mean, it, from my perspective, if I'm an analytics guy, I'm going to break each movement down and I'm going to measure a swing that that adds or subtracts all those different movements until I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I lock out, is that, does that produce more energy? Yes. Mm -hmm. You get more exit velocity. Mm -hmm. it, does it repeat itself? Yes, it does. Can, th can you, can you get around on an inside fastball? Yes. Actually quicker, mm -hmm. not as quick, but just as quick or quicker yep. you get around on an inside fastball. I'm going to, I'm going to do some stuff really recent, really soon. I'm going to start putting a bunch of stuff out. Um, I'm going to start a club, I think, um, sometime early next week, probably on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to start blasting it out over the next couple of days. But we're going to do a bunch of little tests and a bunch of things that are kind of demos um, at, on the physical side of mechanics. Mm -hmm. And then we'll kind of branch through the whole process. But also, we're going to talk a lot about the the effective velocity stuff. Mm -hmm. That'll be the primary thing. The first couple months is is going to be the 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 pitching side of it. Mm -hmm. In order to show hitters what it is that they're missing, I think the world has to see what good pitching is first. And I and and it's not right now. Yeah. There's only there's only a certain amount of guys that really understand what it is that they're doing. Now, just, I, I did a study for the Reds, and I. And it was about a week ago, so they had 19 losses. 18 of the of the 19 losses came on an EV inefficient pitch, and it was it's always super obvious. There was one, there was one game winning hit, and it was just a it was a ball that was thrown a fastball in, and he hit a little dribbler ground ball that ended up scoring a winning run. Mm. But but that, there was only one of those out of the 19 wins. Mm. All of the others were there were 18 losses that happened as a result of all of those other mistakes that guys make. Yeah. At the end of the day, it, it, to me, it comes down to testing each individual thing. And you can't do that without, um, 
without without doing swing experiments. Mm -hmm. And the reason there's no there's no tested long term testing thing in baseball, there is actually. There's like you said, there's a, if you go back just a little while in baseball, you're going to see a bunch of guys that that locked out. Mm -hmm. um, Keith Hernandez. Uh, I mean, there, there's a ton of guys that were either really close or completely locked. And before impact, they all lock out. Yeah. When you do the studies, when you look at the hardest hit balls, it they're they're all they all look like that. Even guys that don't normally do it. Yeah. They all look like that. Um. At, at the end of the day, though, I think it comes down to just testing every individual thing, and that hasn't been done yet. No. Yeah, I skipped over that part. Yeah, and like we've talked before, I think it all comes down to your operating system as a teacher, as a coach, is what is the what is the main thing that you want your hitters to accomplish? And we've talked a lot about a high consistency of hard hit contact, right? So we we this we've discussed before that the best hitters in the world at the big league level will miss eight of the time and they'll hit it right on the screws 20% of the time, right? 20% line drive rate. And then roughly 40, 40 ground ball and fly ball rates. So if they're missing 80% of the time, then uh, I've really over the last year, year and a half, and most of this talk a year and a half ago, I would have thought I, I went nuts talking about real versus feel and that I actually used the swing down concept for hitters that are swinging up. You know, I would have thought I was nuts. Um, but the having what your operating system is, is it, to reduce strikeouts, you know, I've, we've talked before that there's a couple readers of mine, or one in particular, that it's reduce strikeouts at all costs for hitters, <laughs> all costs. So that's his main operating system. So do you think you're going to make different decisions based on what you teach on the swing? Like you're going to take different, grab different things that are going to surround that operating system of reducing strikeouts. So you're not going to take, you're going to take less um, less chances. You are going to have more of a defensive swing. You might be more into the, the, the sitting back type swing, right? The Joey Votto two strike adjustments we've talked about. That's going to be basically the swing because that's what Joey Votto with two strikes. Those are the adjustments he's decided to do because he's wanted to cut down on the strikeouts with two strikes. So the things that he did, those adjustments, uh, choking up, uh, you know, all those different things, shortening up, those things are going to have a consequence, like you say. So like with Mike Trout, same thing with his average exit velocity on pitches down in a way is 101 miles an hour, not his top out, but his average. So 100, 101 miles an hour and his average exit velocity on up and in is 80. So he's giving up to have that look away, adjust in swing or look in, adjust away. Uh, but in that sense, it's more looks looks like more of it's in a look away, adjust in. Well, that's going to have a consequence. And that's 20 miles an hour on average of ball exit speed. He's giving up by having that approach. And I tell my hitters, 20 miles an hour ball exit speed, if you multiply, if you conservatively for, you know, use four feet as for every one mile an hour, he's giving up 80 feet of distance, 80 feet. And if you're using six, if you're being more liberal with it, that's six times 20, it's 120 feet. So 180 and 120 feet, he's given up. That is way too much, way too much to give up. If you're giving up eight feet by you know, impact some guys. Well, that, that depends, though. That depends on how often it's happening. <laughs> if if no one's throwing fastballs up there and challenging yeah. you, yeah. Because if I'm throwing in the from the other dugout, if I'm calling pitches, yeah, he gets zero fastballs yeah. that aren't at that elevated place. Yeah, because that's the place that um, that he's shown that he's going to make an, an an adjusted swing at. Mm -hmm. I already win if I can get him at 80 miles an hour. So the only fastball he's ever going to see is that one. Mm -hmm. And why people don't do that, I don't know. I mean, I have honestly, I, I really can't even imagine after seeing night after night after night after night after year after year, him doing the same thing over and over and over again mm -hmm. and crushing balls at the bottom of the zone on fastballs and, and doing a great job of adjusting to any off-speed pitches because they're all in that same rhythm. They yeah. all They all – show up at the right time in order to to stay within his rhythm mm -hmm. and so he crushes off speed pitches really well mm -hmm. it's his 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 overall body of work is phenomenal <clears throat> and so for him having this one little flaw big deal right and i i don't disagree actually um until 
-hmm. the pitching changes. When the pitching changes and he's facing Berlander or someone that's that's 95 plus and they're shoving right there and that's the only fastball he's going to get, then he's going to have to make an adjustment on that. Yeah. And then what happens? That that's the part that we don't know. And this was goes back to our earlier statement that there's no way to test something if the whole world's doing it in in one way. There's right. no way to test the other way unless somebody goes out on a limb and just starts doing it a, a different way, mm -hmm. um, like pitch sequencing. Until someone does it, which we've seen already, we've seen Blake Snell completely change um, the way he goes about it, mm -hmm. and he blew up. He cut his ERA in half. Snell, I mean, um, DeGrom, same basic thing. Although he's had a little blowback of late. That, that's a whole other discussion. That, that's going to be one of my topics when, when I get the club going is mm -hmm. – is exactly what happened. I, I did a study of him before he started going a little, before he had his rough outings. And I called Carlos and said, hey, you know, I know this is going to sound crazy, but even though DeGrom is going crazy right now, mm -hmm. and, he, and he lit it up last year, um, when, when I assign a value to each pitch over the course of the sequences, mm -hmm. he's actually in a little bit of, um, he's at risk pretty often. Hmm. And, and I think it's just a matter of time before he starts um, having trouble. And he said, well, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that because it, how, does, how does that make effective velocity look? And I said, well, it is what it is. You know, it's a measurement. And hmm. right now the measurement is, is that he's doing well, but it, he's, he's teetering on the edge. And then sure enough, he had three back-to-back, -back, you know, rocky outings for – a couple of them really rocky, even for anybody, but but for him especially. Mm -hmm. So that 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 whole concept of of being um, being able to measure every individual thing, and then that's analytics. Analytics is being able to take something that's happening in real life and put a real number to it. And the reason analytics hasn't embraced EV more is the fact that there's no measurement for timing in their mind, at least not to not yet. Mm -hmm. um, the second you can measure timing, which you can already, they just have not have chosen not to do that. I, I don't, I don't really understand that either, mm -hmm. but it's like, if, if you look at Mike Trout and you say, I'm going to pitch him, I'm going to throw fastballs down because I'm going to try to limit the damage and I'm going to try to get more ground balls. The problem with that theory is a lot. Actually, I, I, I want to share with you at some point yeah. a study I just did recently that's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy to me mm. at how you miss these numbers. I, I it's it, it's baffling. But but at the end of the day, if you if you take a guy like Trout and you just use historical data to come up with a theory as to how to pitch to him, you're just going to do the same thing and just try to be better at it. Mm. You know, we're going to try to be more precise with throwing it down and away, and it doesn't work. The concept doesn't work because it, it doesn't measure. How, what it is that he's doing that's, that's, that puts him at a little bit of risk. The one chink in the armor is the fact that he's, um, he's not really good on this because he chooses to adjust to it rather than sit on it. Mm -hmm. And as long as that's the case, he's going he's gonna to be allowed to swing at a slower fastball. That's why he's also really good at adjusting to off-speed pitches because they're, they're, the speed differentials are, are less. Yeah. So he gives this up in order to get this extension on at the bottom of the strike zone and on off speed pitches. And it's, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, if you only had one methodology, that would be the one to choose Yeah. until the pitchers make a really strong statement and stop doing it in, in the old historical analytical way. Right. And I think that's, that's the biggest hurdle I think for what we're talking about on, the front arm shape and stuff like that is a lot out there are on that adjustable swing and they're having a hard time moving away from that because again, you can see trout doing it. You can see majority hitters. And like you say, this is a target rich environment. Well, any really hitting approach is going to work. You might see a huge difference in the strikeouts, you know, like this last year we had more strikeouts than, than hits in the big leagues, but you may not see a huge dip 
um, you know, pitching, like you said, isn't even optimized yet. And when it does, and, and hitting's still behind. I mean, hitting's starting to catch up, but if pitching takes more slack and, and you see the train, the, the engine of the train keeps uh, going farther out in front, the, the box cars or the hitters are going to have a harder time catching up unless they know now what's what's going to happen. Um, the question I was going to ask you, if so you think if if Trout adjusts, say he starts seeing less fastballs down, he starts seeing them up, do you think he'll be more armbar-ish up in the zone if he makes that adjustment? or how do you Well, think not he- necessarily armbarred, but he will get more extension up there. He did it one year, 2015. Yeah. Um, he actually hit six bombs in the up and in corner. Mm. 2014, he had a in 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 the up and in box and the middle up box. Mm-hmm. He had zero 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 hard hit balls in the up and in box, and he had an 050 hard hit ball rate in the middle up box. Mm-hmm. So he literally just didn't hit pitches in two out of the nine boxes yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. Just no damage, no homers, nothing. Yeah, and then the next year he hit like six homers up there, and he crushed balls in that in that area. I I, I refer to it as um, speeds as like one, two, three, and four, and so one being the fastest fastball mm-hmm. in, yeah, and two being the slow slower fastball away or down. Mm-hmm. He crushed twos in 014 and crushed threes and crushed fours, and then in fifteen he started getting pitched up here more and he made an adjustment and he started leaving the yard on balls up and in. Mm-hmm. And he, his hard hit ball rate went through the roof on ones. It, it like it more than doubled. Mm. And then he his two hard hit ball rate was the same. And his three though went down a little bit and four went down like 300 points. Wow. So he did, he did make an adjustment over the course of that year and probably a couple, you know, he ebbed and flowed a little bit depending on the pitcher, but you know, whether he could do that all the time, yes, he could, but, but there would be a cost. There's always a cost to every adjustment you make. Yeah. If you start focusing up here, you have to get quicker with your decisions. And so now you're going to chase more. Now you're going to swing and miss more on pitches that look like fastball. And -hmm. then they are not. And so that's why guys that think that they're buying all this time by, by cheating the swing and spinning and staying back or bringing the hands in to make a shorter arc to, to buy more time, yes, that does buy you time, but at a cost of mechanical efficiency, number one, and at a cost of reach of area that you lose out in front. So I know he would adjust 100%. Yeah. I'm positive. His dad played in the in the Twins organization when I was still there. Um, one of my uh, <clears throat> good friends, Todd Budke, who's who works with um, he was he's probably I, mean, I don't even, don't even want to say probably he's the top hitting guy in the world in in fast pitch softball. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he played in the Twins organization with me also, but he played with with Mike Trout's dad, who was a stud by the way. He mm-hmm. could hit, mm-hmm. really hit. Um, but he didn't have the power and he didn't have the wheels that his, that his son has. Um, but he, my point was, was that he absolutely would adjust. There's no question in my mind because he gets off his back. So he does a lot of good things that are kind of like uh, recession proof. You know, even when the pitchers adjust, he will too. Yeah. And there are certain hitters that will automatically just adjust, but there are certain hitters. And the ones I'm talking about are the ones that have, more of, of that that concept. Chris Davis Orioles. Yeah. Um, there, there's a ton of guys. But, but every guy that doesn't release off the backside, every guy that gets caught um, loading in a way where they load on their back leg mm-hmm. and to try to create more hang time, those guys are in trouble. The guys that are that are that have a, a really severe – 15, 18 degree attack mm-hmm. angle. Those guys are in trouble unless unless they can quickly make some kind of an adjustment. But we'll we'll see. I mean, only time will tell. Yeah. And for, for, but it, it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen pretty soon. I think. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you'll see it dramatically happen this year. You've seen it with some guys. There are some guys 
and, and you see scatterings around with different teams. I'll bet if I did a study today um, versus this much of time last year that fastballs, there's more elevated fastballs this year um, by, a, by a fairly large percentage. Last year it was like that the lowest teams were 38% use up there. Mm -hmm. The best teams were 44. The Red Sox were at 52. Um, DeGrom was like at 59. Mm -hmm. And I think Snell was really close to that as well with how often they use fastball at the top of the strike zone. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that, that, that number one number, that just that simple number, if everyone just started throwing fastballs top of the zone and focused on that, hitting would be much, much more difficult. Yeah. Because all those things happen. All those things come into play now. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't do 100% Ferris wheel or you couldn't do 100% rotational or you couldn't do 100% of whatever it would have to take. It would be hybridized of everything, which is the way it should be, I think, when kind of coming back again to A-Rod's video and we'll start to kind of um, – Kind of transition out here and then we'll we'll give you some time you got some new stuff you kind of already mentioned here but just to reiterate uh towards the end of this video because i want to be respective of your time we're getting close to the 12 30 mark um with a rod and that real versus feel that a year and a half to two years ago i would have chastised a rod just like everybody else and it's, and it's funny i mean the guy's worth what if you still got his money i'm sure hundreds of millions <laughs> no i mean he, he don't care about what Perry Husband or Joey Myers is saying, or even right. man, he don't care. He's not, you know, he's, he took, he probably drank a couple bottles of wine, told J Lo to grab the camera and said, Hey, we're going to show these people a thing or two, you know, and so <laughs> the video, Hey, all good. But you know what? I, he, like I've told, like I told readers that I think he's, he's right and wrong at the same time. I'm, I'm not going to chastise the guy because some of the things he's saying is, yeah, we do tell hitters to swing down, get their, get on top of the ball, barrel above the hands, all those bad cues I used to, to, to do this to like a vampire. Um, we use those for hitters that have more of that purely, I don't want to call it Ferris wheel. It just, it's just an uppercut swing. They, they cast out. So we to tighten them up and to get them, uh, again, the body's always a step behind the brain. We, we use those cues uh, brain-wise in an extreme fashion to get the body to be that one step behind, but actually ends up in the middle. So there's that real versus feel. Um, how to be an effective hitter, obviously we've talked in this video, swinging down on it does not make the ball go up consistently. Maybe a few times, if you deflect it in the right way, it's going to do that. But like you said, in physics, the hardest hit balls are the ones where you got the ball coming in, you got the barrel coming, and it's right center to center contact going up. And if, you're, if your barrel is going down to a ball that's coming down, then that center to center contact is going to happen less. So you, you can't you can't refute that. That's just physics. You, you just can't be consistent that way. And if you can, boy, you're on another planet or something. But uh, yeah, that's not what we're seeing, the real part of this, right? Um, so how to be an effective hitter, like I said, I, I believe in the three-dimensional parts of hitting. So you've got the verticals you have to control, you have the horizontals, and then you have the timing aspect. And we've mentioned a lot of things in this video. And you can go to hittingasaguest.com. Perry is the father, the, the godfather of timing when it comes to hitters and pitchers and being able to, to work that. And also a lot of the, a lot of his stuff too also is helps with the verticals and the horizontals. Cause we've mentioned testing and evaluation off of the T regular hitting a regular ball, hitting a heavy ball, and then doing uh, live, live testing. So we're not just testing ball exit speeds. You're testing hitting around a 10 degree target and how, how consistent a hitter can be with that. So we're testing all that. We're testing verticals, and we're testing horizontals. And the last part, the sabermetrics and the experience uh, versus experience to tie all this together. Again, you can't be one way or the other. I had heard uh, just a, sh a quick story from, I was talking to Taylor Gardner and, and they had a, an A guy, a class A guy that had called him. like, Taylor goes, dude, you got to listen to this. So he puts us on a three way and, and I'm not going to mention the guy's name. I don't even remember. I don't think I remember the guy's name. Um, cool dude. But he was telling me that his hitting coach is long story short, um, he's driving the ball, driving the ball, driving the ball during batting practice, I guess. And his coach asked him a question. It wasn't the right answer he didn't give. And so the coach was like, oh, and then they kind of got into a little verbal battle about how hitting should be. And, and this, this coach, the hitting coach, told him that you have to, your feel, what you're feeling, you have to feel like you're taking a sledgehammer and you're swinging it down into the ground and, and knocking down. 
uh, cinder block, right? But he's but the thing was he was hitting the ball on a line, just just gapping balls during BP, and so it was weird that the conversation even came up. But he was obviously wanted to hear himself talk. Um, and so come to find out, long story short, this guy never played past little league, junior high, high school, something like that. He's an econ guy. He's an eco economics guy. So apparently in this organization, and this is the Cardinals organization, they're a little behind, I guess. But in the Cardinals organization, they have hired all their coaches. A lot of their coaches are econ people. And correct me if I'm wrong out there. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this guy's wrong. But correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is ridiculous to have a bunch of econ guys coaching a bunch of athletes who these guys know nothing about nothing. So you – you can't have zero experience in all saber metrics, and you can't have all experience in no saber metrics like A Rod and some of these other guys that talk. I think you have to have a nice little blend, and that's what I like about Perry is that he takes, and it's not just saber metrics for saber metrics sake. Perry's taking specific metrics, whether it's applied to hitting or pitching, and he's asking questions again, being scientific about it, using the scientific method of you have you asked a question. Okay, what if more fastballs get get blended into the pitching sequence. What happens to the hitters, right? So you ask a question, you have a hypothesis. I'm sure you have a hypothesis as well. We're probably going to have more swings and misses and things because you could see by this, this uppercut type of mentality with, this, with the teaching the swing, that's most likely what's going to happen with it. And then you, you collect the data and you kind of compare and contrast and you come to your conclusions at the end, right? So that's what I like about Perry is that it's not sabermetrics for sabermetrics sake. You're taking, you're asking a question, you're looking to the right metrics to kind of see if you can play that out and, and see what the, if it answers your question, um, if it confirms or not doesn't confirm your hypothesis. Uh, but you're using specific kinds of data because data alone, and I think Perry might have told me this, uh, but it's, it's like a rational, logical thought is uh, number, numbers don't have brains. People have brains. So people have to take the numbers and they have to look at the numbers in a way that gives us answers to the questions that we have. Um, and aside from that, that was, that was kind of what the, this video was kind of about. I know we didn't really talk too much about the intric intricacies of Alex Rodriguez's hitting theory but uh, methodology, but kind of wanted to shine some light on that. So Perry, do you have any parting thoughts or anything? Yeah, you know, there was one more thing he mentioned um, about swinging down, which was imparting backspin on the ball, yeah. <laughs> which, which it, it would if you actually swing down and catch the ball like that, it's going to create that. But backspin is so overrated when it comes to to having the ball fly. It it yes, backspin is important, and that's one of the reasons why when a curveball spinning forward spin, top spin, yeah. and you hit it, you continue that 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 same spin so it doesn't lose as much energy at impact and that's why curveballs and sliders that are that are up go so far right. but it's also why fastballs at the bottom of the zone have an increase in exit velocity and it's usually about six or eight miles an hour um, when you look at a player typical player like uh, a guy who's a, a top hitter in exit velocity when you look at fastballs versus all pitches mm -hmm. when they hit ground balls there's a big jump in exit velocity because the, the fastball has backspin, right? Yep. And as you hit the top of the, the middle, it takes that forward spin and continues it. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is, is, is why ground balls have such a higher batting average than, than fly ball. The recent study I did was, is crazy. Yeah. When you, when, when you look at the, the pop-ups, if you add pop-ups into fly balls and you take out line drives, the average in, in Major League Baseball at 95 miles an hour or less, in other words, that's enough to hit it out of the yard. Yeah. But most of those are in play. The batting average is 078 yeah. across the board. Yeah. And when you look at 190 mile an hour ground balls, <laughs> the, the batting average is like 380. Yeah. And it's, it's almost 400 on – 95 mile an hour ground balls and it's 441 on 100 mile an hour ground balls right and those happen way more often when you have pitches that have that good spin mm -hmm. and then the, the the ball hits or the bat hits just above the center and it doesn't lose any of that momentum at the bottom of the strike zone good point. so you crush ground balls mm -hmm. because they you don't lose as much energy so if you took and reversed the two locations 
and threw more fastballs up mm-hmm. and and more curveballs down, you make that the, the that transition of being able to turn the spin around way way easier. Good point. The backspin by itself is is not the thing that makes the ball go farther unless you get the wind at your back. Right. If you if you're hitting into the wind, the backspin's the, your worst nightmare. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. You want some backspin, but you want the kind that you get when you just miss hitting it perfect mm-hmm. and the ball deflects up a little and it has enough backspin to keep the ball in the air, right. but it doesn't have enough backspin to make it have that rise effect. Yeah. There's, it's just a, the more spin you have, the more deflection you have. And that means you have less exit velocity. So there's a certain percentage when, when you can hit it and get a lot of spin and still have it leave the yard, but, but only in certain, or only in certain circumstances. Yeah. So backspin, backspin is so vastly misunderstood. I think. Yeah. When when they talk about that. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good point. I I remember the curveball, Dr. Robert Adair, the phys- physicist that wrote the physics of baseball. You know, he said that about the curveball travels the farthest. And like what you're saying, from a hitter's perspective, the curveball is coming with backspin. And so then if you you meet it with backspin, obviously not too much, but like we're talking about just a little bit, just to keep it flowing and you don't have to reverse course of what the ball's, how the ball's spinning so you don't lose energy, of course it's going to go. But also the same, same thing is true. I didn't think about it that way on a four-seam fastball or really any kind of fastball from the hitter's perspective is coming with um, – the curveball is coming from, with top spin uh, from his perspective, but you're hitting it with backspin, you're keeping the spin in the same, right? Did I get that wrong? Right. Um, but then on the fastball, it's uh, from the hitter's perspective, it's coming with uh, backspin. Back. And then if you if you like, you're talking about the reason why the ground balls are there's so many more hundred mile an hour ground balls or whatever uh, plus mile hour ground balls is because if you're out in front and you're coming up the top of it, well you're you're keeping the same spin. You're not changing the spin of the ball, and so that's why you're getting like John Carlos Stanton that 120 what was it 123.8 miles an hour ball exit speed is a one hopper to the shortstop double play um, because he got extended on a slider away or whatever it was, you know, Um, but he he topped it. Obviously he was out in front. So he kept the spin. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if it was a slider. It might've just been a fastball. Um, But anyway, good point on that. Um, So respect for your time. Where can we find you Perry? And then anything you mentioned the, the club, uh, any, any kind of new things just to reiterate. Yeah, I'm going to start the club. I'm going to start blasting it out um, probably tomorrow. And we're, it's, it's going to be kind of like a membership thing with, uh, and the first, uh, I think for the first week, I'm going to have it at about um, 65% off and okay. just to kind of get people started on it. Launching it. Because I want to, I want to, I want to, I'm, it's going to be a daily thing, Monday through Friday. So I'm going to send out like a 15 minute video every day that has either some demos or um, like a study of a hitter or study of a pitcher. It'll be like uh, an at-bat that really stood out from an EV standpoint, um, good or bad. Um, You know, the 17 strikeouts last night, uh, I'll definitely touch on that. The one homer that he hit was, of course, an at-risk pitch, Mm -hmm. and it always is. (laughs) (laughs) at the end of the year day, whatever, it's always the same. Yeah. Um, but we're, but the, the club will be basically that like a 15, 20 minute video every day, Monday through Friday. And it'll just kind of show up in a personal locker. Okay. Um, but most, I think it'll be a whole lot of fun. We're going to do one for baseball okay. and we're going to do one for softball. I'm going to do it with uh, Todd. Side or are you going to be doing it on the hitting side too? Yeah, I'm going to do some, I'm going to do quite a bit of stuff. You know, and we'll 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 do a lot of stuff back and forth for sure. I I, I would love to uh, continue that. Well, just but just most of the oh, just so people most know of the stuff signing. I want to do in the beginning is going to be on pitching. Okay, so just be, so people know what they're they're signing up for. I know we're going to do some stuff. Uh, just when people go, oh, let me check that out because I'm going to try and get this out. I'm going to get this out tomorrow. Uh, this this video, get it out out to my list tomorrow, so that people go, oh, you know, it's fresh in their mind. They can they can look for it now. Where can they find that? Uh, hitting is a guest.com. Okay. Are you going to have um, a I'll, bar that says join the club or something like that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put something up that makes send, it easy. Send me that link and I can include it in this, in the notes, show notes for this. Okay. Very cool. And then um, it is in a guest. So that'll be a good one. I think, I think that'll be a good, 
good promo for that. Uh, as for me, hitting performancelab.com, you, you can go you can go to hittingperformancelab.com. There's a, a bar at the top that has the the current or the uh, second edition of the catapult loading system you can get for free book. Just play shipping and handling eight ninety five or whatever. Um, at the startinglineupstore.com, I've been doing a lot of work with that over the last year, and there's some some cool T-shirts we're doing. I'm going to do a lot more premium T-shirts and designs, things like that. And there's some there's some other uh, hitting aids in there as well, so you can go there. There's like ten percent off, get ten off. Uh, all caps, get ten off. Uh, ten the number and then off spelled out. So other than that, man, anything else, Mr. Perry? Always a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Yeah, my my pleasure. I uh, always I love talking hitting with you because you're open minded and we're uh, kind of of the same mindset. I mean, I know there's some different stuff, but at the end of the day, I, you know that's okay with me as long as people are open enough to to hear what everybody else is saying and see if it makes sense and and <laughs> have the the courage to actually test. Right. At the end of the day, that's all I care about. Yeah. If your if your theory is good, then let's test it and let's find out. Right. And I and I don't maybe how we teach is a little different. You know, you and I'm again I'm kind of moving more towards that front arm arm shape, uh, longer front arm shape, uh, more locked out and stuff with my hitters. I just think that you're killing two three birds with one stone with what I'm doing. So by doing that, if if the hands don't go back, and again we can this is a whole can of worms. We can talk another hour about this. I'm sure, but. I tell my hitters that it's not going back towards the catcher. You're actually going back in the corner. So uh, the hand should end up somewhere behind or over or behind the hitter's back foot at, at landing. So that's if we're extending the arm there and we're going this way, you, you, you do a couple things. Three things. You front arm shape, lengthen it out. Number two, you get the, the uh, front scap protraction, so showing numbers. And then you get the back scap retraction or hiding the hands. So that's three things you're knocking out just by locking the arm, the arm out and getting it back, uh, in the corner. I call it the corner. So if you're standing in a in a bathroom and you you're standing where like my view here is the mirror, and I were to move my hands back into the corner behind me, then that's what that's where we're trying to go with the direction, and we're not going back towards the door to go back out of the bathroom. Um, but anyway, I don't think we teach. I don't think we. It's, it's a little different teaching wise, but I think it's the same thing. I don't think we really disagree on a lot of it. And like you said, as long as you're testing it and it tests out optimized over it's the counterpart, then, you know, what are we talking about? And then it's just, it's just philosophy and theory. And we're just philosophers sitting on a rock with our, you know, with our hand like this, kind of, you know, we're talking. So talking we're, about stuff that can never be proven. <laughs> yeah. What is, is, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not doing that. We're testing it. We're, we're trying to find out what each contributes to the swing mechanically. And if you don't right. know that, if you don't have a base of that, then how do you know if something is a power thing like a rod, uh, the back knee going down to the ground? How do you know if that's even a power thing, if you haven't tested it out? And I can tell you it's not, it's a, it's how to adjust the pitches up or down. I mean, if you look at Adrian Beltre or some of those guys that really do that a lot, that use their knees, it's not so much of a power thing. It's more of how they're adjusting the pitches up or down, being able to get under a ball, you know. Um, so are you still there, Perry? Yeah, I got a, I got a scam call. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, so on that note, then on scam call note, I'll let you go. Cause I, I got to get some lunch too. I'm sure you got to run and get some lunch. Um, but Hey, again, I appreciate the talk and I agree with you. I think we have good talks because we're both open-minded, both, both open to testing our, our stuff. And if our stuff doesn't pan out, then I, I don't mind throwing it aside and, and taking the better optimized version. Um, but other than that, man, I'll get this out. We'll see if we can get some people signing up for the club and, um, we'll do, we'll do it on the next one. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, Perry. Enjoy the time. Take care, bud. Take care, man. All right, bud. Bye. Bye. The Hitting Performance Lab wants to know, did you know repeatable hitting power does not start in the hips? Have you heard the expressions, load and explode the hips? Power comes from the hips. Well, we created a free video revealing the results of a scientific study that will show you how we added 48 feet of batted ball distance instantly and it's not all about the hips. Click here now to get the video while it's still free.